Ladies and gentlemen, how are you? It's Adam Steele. It's been too long. Uh, we are back after the new year with the Behind Music Tech podcast. And our first guest back after the break is the one and only Warren Hewitt. You know him, you love him. Of course, this being a Produce Like a Pro podcast, uh, he is the patriarch of the entire Produce Like a Pro family. And he is a longtime experienced mix engineer producer and he has just released his new book, Home Studio Recording, The Complete Guide. They've spent three years making this, and so I tried to get Warren for an interview, and we got it. We got successful. And so we got a very long talk with the man himself, partly about the book, but partly about him and how he came up as a businessman, as a producer, how he kind of came into YouTube and doing it the kind of the, the the backwards way of being a businessman with a working business and then wanting to show the world about it rather than being a YouTuber as a career. He kind of came in the other way around and I thought that was fascinating to talk to him about. So without further ado, here is Mr. Warren Hewitt. If you're listening to this on the MP3 version, the video version's on my channel, Adam Steele. If you're watching the video version of this, the MP3 version is on the Produce Like a Pro podcast feed. So check that out. And now, Warren Hewitt. Warren Hewitt, my friend, how are you? I am good. And yourself? Uh, yes, I am here. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> fine. Time difference being what it is, I'm interviewing you uh, late in the evening, but no, no bother as we say. Um, so, uh, for those who don't know you, I mean, the three people left on this planet who... Um, <laughs> <laughs> if only, but I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. In, in music production, we've, we've both been doing this a long time, but you've been doing this a lot longer than me, I think. Cause you, I, yeah, you, I might be a little bit older than you. It, yes. yes, but <laughs> more specifically in the YouTube kind of space, because you got in really early, didn't you? I don't know that. I don't know if it was that early. When did you launch your channel? Uh, six years ago, so twenty seventeen. I thought it was earlier, but I checked the dates. It wasn't. There you go. No, I I, I did uh, middle end of fourteen. So we're eight coming on nine years. But not. I mean, when I started, the the bigger channels were. Glenn already had like two hundred thousand followers. Um, Pensada had like a hundred and ten. Graham Cochran, remember him? He had like 200,000, you know, so they, they were like the big channels when I started, you know, um, they, they were already going like three or four years. So I suppose now looking back, it seems like I was one of the earlier ones, but didn't feel like it at the time because all these other channels already had like one or 200,000 subscribers when I started. Well, that's an interesting point in itself because you very much have bucked the trend there then because like I started I was a few years later and I was looking up at these greats like like you say, Glenn and Fluff as well and you and, and going, I'm never going to be able to Pensado, reach them yeah. and Dave Pensado, yeah. of course. And and you very much bucked the trend and have catapulted up to, is it half a million uh, subscribers now or is it more? Uh, I think we're about to hit 700,000. Yeah. Significantly more. Then, yeah. <laughs> which pretty much puts you as the leading lights of, of music production on YouTube. Yeah, thank you ever so much for saying that. I I, I do think that, and we ha I have this conversation with uh, you know uh, people all the time. We're we're a little different to some of those other channels because they're um, they can be very focused in one genre or one facet of it. Yeah. Where as you know, you know you've been involved on many of our videos. We tend. We tend to have a, a bigger audience because we're not just doing metal, we're not just doing rock, we're not just doing country, we're not just doing hip hop, we're not just doing EDM. You know, one like this week, we've had two videos to do with hip hop, sandwiched between a rock video, and then we did a breakdown on a, a soul song. And then next week, it might be full blown. In fact, actually, last week was almost all metal, you know, because we had Dan Weller. So, and then. Next week, we're going to be talking, well, it will be this week when this comes out, we're talking about the book release and we're talking about stuff around it. So there's all these, I think the reason why we have a large subscriber count and why we continually grow relatively rapidly is because we're talking to so many different kinds of people. Produce Like a Pro is always about bringing people together as a community that could share ideas because I know you're a fan of really good music and you know the best music is when 
you take like a bit of soul, a bit of funk, a bit of disco, a bit of metal, a bit of EDM, a bit of this, and put it together and invent something new. Yes. Um, and I've always loved those channels we're talking about that you know, centered around one genre, and I go to them all the time to get information about one specific genre. But at the end of the day, gun to my head, favorite bands, Queen, you know, another one bites the dust. You know, it's it's a disco song. Crazy Little Thing Called Love. It's a 50s rock and roll song, you know. I, I just love it when music comes together and, and pushes the boundaries. And, you know, that's how we had, like, bands like Depeche Mode and New Order and, of course, Joy Division. That was 70s disco, American disco, meets German synth pop. It was Noi, Tangerine Dream, Kraftwerk, and Chic. Boom. And then you get Depeche Mode and Joy Division and New Order. That's... I like that. That's been, always been my love of like being able to bring things together, and I think that's the reason why we have a large subscriber count because we're not just talking to one piece of an audience; we're talking to lots of different audiences at once. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, with this podcast being kind of focused on kind of the the business side of things, mostly. I mean, yes, if people want to hear you talk about specific mixing stuff, I mean, even with me, let alone with anybody else, we can talk till the cows come home. And there's loads and loads of stuff. Sure, about let's do that. it. I'll put my feet up and uh, you know, let's, <laughs> oh, yes. get, let's get ready. <laughs> yeah, but that's I mean, that's that's what you're famous for is like you know talking for two three hours uh, with without a pause about you know the specifics <laughs> of. Something mix, something production, whether it's with somebody like, it was a couple of weeks ago, was it David Bottrell, one of my heroes? Um, or da- yeah, any, David Bottrell, such big a sweetheart. names. Uh, and just, just Daniel Lanoir a couple of weeks before that, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a dream come true to sit in a room and talk to Bob Clearmountain, the best mixer in the world. You know, every every mixer I love's favourite mixer. So to sit down and, and, and become friends with him and, and and get to get inside of his mind, um, mm. and then talk to like I say David Bottrell, or Daniel Lanois, you know, people, and then the musicians, of course, talking of that those records, Tony Levin, you know, I had an amazing talk with Tony Levin, talking about all the records he made with mm. all of those guys, Daniel Lanois, you know, David <laughs> David Bottrell, you know, with King Crimson, and and um, yeah, it's an incredible. Yes. We're we're blessed to be able to do this for a living, my friend. Indeed. And so we'll come back to that, but let's rewind and come back to that from the beginning of the channel, because what not everybody will know is you know, a lot of people that you see on YouTube doing mixing that kind of thing, you know, they start as kind of as YouTube personalities, but you and me, but we're focusing on you today, uh, started as actual working engineers. So you were mostly a producer, Pro Tools engineer. That's how you kind of came up, right? Yeah. Was, you were the Pro Tools guy. Yeah, um, I, w- I started off as a guitar player in bands. And so, you know, back in the sort of early 90s when I first started, um, dating myself there, but early 90s, I was the guy that, you know, I was in a band and I could record the band and I would do the demos. And it started, you know, four-track cassettes, then um, ADATs, and then from ADATs eventually to DAWs. And, you know, when when I was making major label records with my band as a musician, I also got to work on two-inch tape as well. So I've had my finger in all of those pies. And then the first records I made as an engineer, I was the Pro Tools engineer on the bigger records. And we were taping on two-inch tape and then transferring to Pro Tools, and I was editing inside of that. Um, But honestly, when DAWs came along, that's when my life changed. I don't know about for you, because you and I are both predominantly guitar players and bass players and stuff. We play stringed instruments. To me, DAWs were like, ha, ah, because it was like a level playing field with keyboard players. Yes, very much so. Because keyboard players basically went, blah, 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 and then just put it into MIDI and went, blah, 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 correct, move that along. Oh, that's too loud. Turn it down. That's out of time. Oh, played the wrong note. Correct it. And there <laughs> suddenly there was a DAW that came along and you could play a part down and you could love it you know, edit and punch in and all this kind of stuff in there. But you're like, well, I like that. Oh, copy and paste. Oh, my God. That chord that sounds better here that isn't out of tune, I can now copy of it. Oh, my God. It was like mind-blowing, you know. And obviously those tools can get overused, but initially it was like, oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, you know. It was like suddenly I could compete with keyboard players. And um, it was a, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it still amazes me to this day. It still amazes me to this day the capabilities we have with DAWs. It's insane. Uh, that, yes. 
they are so powerful. But that's the thing, we, we kind of, on a, on a slight parallel, even though I was kind of further behind, kind of we're at the dawn of that, that DAW age, uh, where now we're kind of passing on our knowledge to people who that is the default, but they've never you know, used one before. So it's a whole different mindset. But from, but talking about the start of the Produce Like a Pro channel, I'm guessing you were still full-time producing at that point. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. It may, it, I mean, I look back at it now, it makes absolutely no sense. But I think that's what was part of in, inherent in the success because I was having some of my biggest years. In 2011 and 2012, I made an Aerosmith record. And I'd made two Frey records, James Blunt, you know, a whole bunch of other artists, like the four or five, six, seven, eight years beforehand. And so I'd made all these major label records and I was doing independent stuff between them and getting really well paid and doing like mid-level bands and all that stuff. And honestly, when I started to produce like a pro in the middle end of 2014, I was having my biggest year ever. You know, I was making really good money. I bought this house here. I had the studio here. So I had like a proper studio with an SSL and 99% of the gear that's in this room I owned before I started to produce like a pro. And it was all bought and paid for by me being an independent producer, engineer, mixer, guitar player, dude. And I just felt like I wanted to start produce like a pro because I realized that my path, which was not going to school, not working in a in a studio, not assisting, not running, not doing any of those things, but actually just being a guy that started off, hey, let's learn to record, you know, bring a band in, write some songs, record it, you know. That was what everybody has to do now. The studio system has shrunk. And yes, there's a wonderful education system out there, but they're training people to go into studios that don't exist anymore. There's not those jobs. So it felt like to me, well, why don't I just start a YouTube channel and what I had is I had this intern, Connor, and Connor would show up at uh, 9 a.m. and between 9 and 11, five days a week, we'd film a video. And he would edit it during the day and we'd put it up the next day. And we did that three to five times a week, three videos to five videos a week, and we didn't even turn on the YouTube monetization. We didn't even run ads. And there was no real reason for me to do it. There was absolutely no reason. I had no money. I was making zero money out of it. And for 18 months... All I did was just make three to five videos a month talking about like, hey, let's EQ a guitar. Oh, why don't we do some drums today? Why don't we do... And, and yeah, it, it was only really after about 18 months and I saw like Tim Pierce who had his guitar channel, who had his own like academy and was like doing stuff that, you know, I saw what he was doing and I was like, oh, you know, I should do that. And then we launched it and it did remarkably well. And obviously to this day still does remarkably well. I mean, I think we've... I would say 2,500. I think we have 4,000 members. And, uh, yeah, we've had 8,500 members come through in the last six years. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an absolute blessing. And I just really can't, I can't say any, enough good things about doing this because it connects me back to people. And it's been slowly, you know, more thing. I spend more of my time doing that, but I don't ever want to be the guy that doesn't record and doesn't mix and doesn't write songs and doesn't play guitar because that's really what I've always wanted to be. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Brian May. And like I always say, I still kind of do. Um, you know, I'd give all of this up to be in a, in a rock band like Queen, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> it's still the dream. Absolutely. I know for you, it'd be, you, you want to be Geddy Lee, I know. Yes, if, if I could be Geddy <laughs> Lee, that would be great. Unfortunately, there's only one Geddy Lee and he's already taken. There's, so, yes. Um, <laughs> Same with, same with Brian May. There's only one yeah. Brian May and, and he's already taken. Yeah. Very much so. So um, talking about, so from the beginning, so you said like maybe 18 months or so, you'd started to get some traction. At what point, and this is kind of the business kind of side of things, at what point are you looking at the bands that you're recording? Because I, I know full well that recording bands is great, but it's a finite level of income. If you're fully booked, it's still, there's a ceiling. At what point with the YouTube did that kind of go, you know what, this could be what I focus on. This could be my main thing. Well, I don't know. If, I don't know if it was ever a conscious decision because um, I've always worked exceptionally long hours. Like exceptionally long hours. Um, Guilty. I yeah. will, <laughs> yep, I will wake up. You know, I've, I've got two kids, so I get up 
somewhere between six and seven o'clock every single morning, and I go to bed somewhere between ten thirty and two thirty in the morning, depending on how late we've worked and what's going on. So some nights I'm getting four hours sleep, some nights I'm getting six. You know, hey, um, and that's just kind of the way it is. Um, and I don't wear that like a badge of honor, like, oh, I'm so much better because I don't sleep very much. No, I, I, I do it because I'm blessed to do what I love for a living. And the reason why I work so much is because I'm running, I'm doing emails. Those questions that are answered on YouTube is me. I answer the questions. Um, it's really important for me to understand people's real needs, wants, and desires. I make videos based on questions that are continually put to me. If somebody, if, a, if people are consistently asking me a question about a piece of equipment, I will hunt it down and review it. Um, there's been a, quite a few times we've contacted a mic manufacturer. It's like, hey, uh, we, we wanted to work with you. We keep set, wanting to send you things. And I'm like, yeah, but now people are asking me to review your product. So please send me something now. You know, I, I, you know I'd much rather be driven by people asking me more than, you know, the other way around. And that's always been really a wonderful thing. And the only way you're going to know that, as you know, as a barometer, is to read the comments and to read your emails and yes. understand I, I have a, you, you haven't asked this question, but I'm going to bring it up. There's a lot of philosophy around about the YouTube world and online marketing and stuff like that. I mean, you and I, I think, have joked about it a few times. The whole, like, was it the six hour work week? You know, you hear people talk about that. Oh, yes. I think that's the biggest BS in the world. That's fine if you've got 18 Eric's doing everything for you. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, but there's this sort of philosophy, and maybe it's fizzing out now, but, you know, this idea that, you know, you just, Bring on, you know, and take your hobby and make a course and then just sit back and watch the money come in, brah. You know, and it's such prevalent kind of, you know, I watch those YouTube videos continuously trying to sell this idea that if you use this teaching software or that, or now it's AI that writes the courses, isn't it? Have you seen that? Yeah. Jesus, oh Mary. Yeah, the AI will do it all for you. <laughs> I, I just don't believe in that. I think if, if, if you can... It, God bless the person that can phone it in and be rich. Um, I don't know if I want to be that guy anyway, mm. because I said to my wife, I don't ever see myself retiring. If I get to live to my late 80s, that would be amazing. And if it means that I can live at a high standard, like maybe be near the beach, that would be nice. I mean, who wouldn't want to be near the beach? My perfect thing was like guitar on a stand, sitting there playing, writing emails, writing a track, you know, what. That sounds great. If I'm doing that at 87 and I'm like, Ugh. you know, if I just learned a new jazz song or learn a new riff or some exercise and the heart gives out, I'll be a happy bunny. I don't really, I'm not trying to get into a six hour work week mentality and run away from what I love. You guys like you and I are so blessed to be able to do this for a living. Mm. There's so many people that want this. The problem is, is that you just have to work your ass off um, and you have, and sometimes it is a lot of work, like actual work and it's stressful and annoying. Um, mm. But most of the time it's great and it's beautiful and I love people. I really do. Um, mm. When I find guys like you and Christian, you know, um, that, that that's Rick Lee. Eric, that dude sitting over there. You know, the, the, these, are, these are people that I actually, Mark Daniel Nelson, these are people that I actually like hanging out with. And it's just like, this is great. We all get to be nerds and be geeky and, and be honest with each other. And, you know, how many professions can you do that with where, you're, where the people you work with are also your friends? Yes. I don't have any friends outside of music. My wife and I had dinner with Ivana Manley and um, Eva Reichstad two days ago. We went out mm. for like a really nice... I'm sitting there with like the owner of Manley and Eva Reichstad, who had just won a Grammy two days before. Just thinking, shoot me. When I was a little kid, you know, first somebody was going to tell me that I was going to... Oh, interviewing, like you said earlier, David Buttrell, you know? Yeah. I mean, a Thrack is one of my favorite records, you know? Yeah. He did Thrack. He won't be King Crimson. Jack Douglas, we call him Uncle Jack. When I was a little kid, I bought my mum, the day it came out, because my mum was a Beatles fan, I bought her the John Lennon record, Double Fantasy. So I bought it. My parents, it was like December 1st, would put up their Christmas tree. 
So they put up the Christmas tree. I can't remember what day it came out. It came out like four or five days before he died. So I went to Boots the Chemist. I don't know what, in your town where they sold records, but uh, uh, ours, they had a Woolies, you know, Woolworths, a Boots the Chemist, and a little a little uh, um, store called the Record Box. And I think I bought it from Boots. And I went in there, and it had just come out, and I bought the album, and I, I wrapped it up, and I put it under the Christmas tree. I think it was the only present or one of two or three that had been put under there. I was all... I was so eager and keen because I was trying to impress my mum. And uh, and I had just started to discover who the Beatles were, even though it was like 1980 and I was a little tiny kid. I just, you know, I, I knew Yellow Submarine because that was a kid's song, you know. So I was just trying to, trying to discover stuff. And then he, he gets assassinated, he gets shot, he gets killed, murdered. And so I go, sorry, mum, and I open it up and I start playing that. And then I, I used to cycle to Venus Records in Farnham, anybody watching that? knows that record store. And I used to cycle there and buy the reissue seven-inch Beatles singles. And so I started collecting all the Beatles albums and everything. But it all goes back to Double Fantasy. And Double Fantasy was produced, I'm sure fans out there will know, by Jack Douglas. Flash forward, you know, 2007. I'm friends with Jack Douglas. 2011, I'm making an album with Aerosmith. I'm the engineer on Aerosmith record. And the producer is Jack Douglas. I mean... (laughs) I could retire now. You know what I mean? I've got, I, I, for three months, we lived in Situate in, 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 uh, in Massachusetts. And we used to drive for about 35 minutes to the studio every morning and, every, and on the way back, Jack would drive and Jack would just tell me stories about working with Lennon and working with Aerosmith back in the 70s and the New York Dolls and stuff like that. He used to tell me stories about John Lennon, which were just mind boggling. We did that for three months. One morning, he'll hate me for saying this, sorry, Jack. One morning, he said to me, John came to me in a dream last night. He told me he would haunt me, and he does. He comes back to me in dreams, and this is what he told me. I'm not going to tell you what he said, but he just, it was just like, what the, what the what? <laughs> you know, it's just like, ah! Does anybody know what it's like to, to be in that, to be in like that situation? Like, one minute, I'm like a little freaking little kid listening to Double Fantasy, Flash forward, I'm an adult, and I'm working with the guy that produced it. And he's my friend, and he's telling me stories. He's been on my channel like 20 times. Yes, just, he has. He's, he's Uncle Jack. Yeah. That's what my kids call him. That's what my wife calls him. But I'll bet that most of that wasn't luck, because something that I definitely want to talk about is something that is very prevalent in our industry specifically, which is workaholism. And I, I'm very much in that camp and I think you are as well, but it's one of those things, you know, people on the outside are saying, oh, you should have some time off or you should, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and they're like, do a hobby. And like, and I, I don't know if you're the same <laughs> as me, but it's like, what is your this hobby? This is my hobby. It's, yeah, it's this. <laughs> and, and, and so that's, that's the thing is that like, I don't need to go fishing. I've got this. And yeah. it's something that, that really people don't understand. And our, our industry in music production and music tech is getting more and more and more and more saturated with these young people coming in who, you know, either just graduated from college or they're 18, 19, and they're like, I want to make it in the industry. And then they want to go and have an, a, you know, a night out and then they want to watch TV. And it's like, you're not going to get where you want to go unless this is your entire life and yeah i'm we've both been people who are like that and i think a lot of the people around us are the same i mean somebody who comes to mind is someone like uh, al schmidt um god rest his soul that, yeah, that was he, a sweetheart he was working until the age of a million and seven you know i think I, he was 90 I th- he was still working till the day he died i think yeah. he was 91 he was i've just looked at the wikipedia article yeah 91 yes, so- I, I i was at his 90th birthday we did it um i think i think i have some video of it I, i'll never share it it's not fair but um yeah uh yeah 90th birthday um and i think the 91st we did it on a zoom we all we all wished him happy birthday right. and sung there was like 20 of us me and my wife and and uh, his his lovely wife as well, and and all of his friends. Al was one of the most loved for honest and obvious reasons. He was hardworking, smart, and um, yeah, one of the most likable people ever. He told me so many incredible stories. So many. I'm going to tell this one. I probably shouldn't, but he um, he told me when they were making that McCartney album, the one with the big band and everything. He told me, you know. 
Paul was very nervous about doing it because it was done like a Sinatra kind of record where you're just kind of out there singing with an orchestra, doing jazz standards and stuff. And Paul, he said after a couple of takes, Paul just nailed it and just just sat in. And, of course, it was amazing. But he told, told me this story. And this is a story about Al, but it's also a story about Paul McCartney that I love. He said Al said it was his <coughs> daughter's birthday and they were mixing, just him and Paul, in the room. And he was waiting for an opportune moment to take a break to call his daughter to wish her happy birthday. And it's a capital and and uh, it's quite, you know, it's quite quiet studio. Everybody's working, but there's not like thousands of people milling around. So it's very private. And he says, look, um, it was stopping for a break. He goes, I was going to call my daughter. And so Paul was like, why? He says, well, I just want to wish her happy birthday. So Al said he went out into the parking lot and he called his daughter and said, you know, happy birthday and all this kind of stuff. And he said, Paul came out, like nobody around. And just said, give me the phone. Gives, Al gives Paul the phone and Paul McCartney sings happy birthday <laughs> to Al's daughter. And he just said it was one of the most beautiful moments because there was no cameras. Nobody was recording that moment. Paul McCartney understood his own importance, had nothing to gain from doing it other than understanding that he's Paul McCartney and that Al's daughter is going to be telling that story for the rest of her life and probably like brought to tears of that moment. And it was just done completely selflessly. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that because they're like, oh, you know, it's Paul McCartney. It's like, no, you don't you understand. Most people, I mean, this is, we were talking about off camera earlier when we talk about YouTube and stuff like that, yeah. is most people, it's an ego-based thing. It is called YouTube, like you, us. I, there's a reason why I always joke it's not called Warren's Place. It's not about me. I'm trying to create community. And it's increasingly why I love having guys like you on the channel and other, I mean, like Ali McGuire's been doing some stuff. Of course, Mark Daniel Nelson, you. Now we have Joe Carroll, Manny Nieto, um, Sarah Carter, who's incredible as well. It's like bringing in other people and reinforcing that this is a universal thing, that the only thing you have to do is have a love of music. And like you're saying, it's really just the work ethic that combines with it. And, you know, you, you hear those kinds of stories about people and you realize they're cut from the same cloth. You know, if anybody's ever read Outliers, which I'm sure lots of people do, it's, I know it's old hat now to talk about that. There was Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. That's a 10 years ago conversation. I know that now. But it's still very important because in the first one or two chapters, Malcolm Gladwell talks about, uh, said that, the Beatles, by the time they had finished in playing in Hamburg, they would do these 12-hour shifts during the day and night. And they would do that seven days a week for like the month they were out. And they, I think they did it for several months over a couple of years and, or, or whatever the time span is. I'm sure you're, one of your viewers will know better. But his point was, he said, before they made their first album, the Beatles had played more live minutes, hours on stage than you two have done in their whole career. Wow. So when the Beatles finally go into the studio for, what was it, 17 hours to cut their first record or 13? I can't remember. Something like that. It's not long yeah. at all. Not long at all. They just go in and do the whole album and it's all recorded live to two track. Which has been covered extensively on Produce Like a Pro, of course. Yes, <laughs> due to Jerry Hammock, my co-writer on my book. Yes, um, indeed. Well, that's yes. probably a really good time to segue into talking about the book. Because we should um, do more of these. We should do more of these. This, this we is fun. Should indeed. But yeah, home yes. studio recording, the complete guide. So yes. the way that I'll lead into this is I'll tell you a quick story about me, because I am Please. Uni university educated, you know, music tech. Ew. I know, I know. Posh, 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 posh. I know you're highfalutin. But when it comes you're down to it, you're the posh one. I've got, I've got the posh accent, but you actually yeah. happen to be the posh guy. Apparently, <laughs> but but pulling back the curtain on that, I mean, aside from having some people, the tutors who were actually there to guide us in person, most of it was here's a load of books, read the books, because this was I started in 2004, so that was before YouTube was even a thing at all. So it was books or nothing. And the books, generally speaking, in my humble opinion, were rubbish. I mean, they would right. have things that were really technical, that, that were very hard to understand coming from just a zero point. Or they would be so insultingly simple with some things, like, you should use an SM57 on a guitar cabinet. It's like, yeah, okay, why? And so 
yeah, I really had to find my own way the hard way and learn everything by going, well, this, this microphone works, but doesn't work here, doesn't work here, and really had to build up pretty much all the knowledge, either from forums, which were equally useless because you had 20 opinions that all disagreed with each other, or do it the hard way with the grind and trying to just ask every mentor person that I could find every question until they got bored of me and kicked me out. But again, with the workaholism that we were talking about before, that kind of definitely helped. But you have condensed pretty much everything that I would have loved to have known into a tome. Not not a small thing, not not a novella. It's no. three it's years. A, three years of writing. Yes. Yep. And yep. and, uh, and I, yeah, looking at this, a good week of reading at my speed. Whew. Wait there, that's impressive. You, it's 453 pages. I might have got down to 425, I can't remember. It originally was 475. Actually, no, 625, then to 475, then 453. And then we got the great, the wonderful Richard Oliver, another another limey like us who got involved and was then able to shave it down just just through pagination, you know, and, and really right. organizing it really super well. I mean, that, and that's really the point. Um, I must say, before we get too detailed on it, uh, working with Jerry Hammock was really a massive deal because Jerry wrote all of those Beatles recording reference manuals. So he had a brain as an engineer um, and as a writer to be able to take all of the ideas, all of the discussion points that I had and organize it into something that really makes sense. And to your point, we looked at every book. We looked at all of the big books, the most successful ones, some that have sold 100,000 plus copies and realized we can do everything they do and more. It was really important to us to make the definitive one. And we did think about it. Do we call it, do we call it like, you know, recording this, recording that. And the reason why I went with home studio recording, even though it covers everything, like recording orchestras and quartets, death metal, country, punk, EDM, hip hop, it doesn't matter. The reason why we call it home studio recording because of like we were talking about earlier, everybody now is recording at home. Even the biggest producers in the world have home studios. And the reality is, unless you're deliberately recording musicians live together in a room, which I still love to do, 99% of what you can do now can be achieved in a very, very small space, very easily and very inexpensively. And the results are still absolutely phenomenal. And so... And that's what this book does. It talks about key choices of gear. Like, for instance, I was looking at it yesterday and talking to somebody about it on camera, and we just zeroed in on this paragraph while I was going, well, look, you could buy a BAE 1073. I have one over there. It's one of my favorite, favorite channels. And if you just had one really nice mic pre that you wanted to to get to record a great vocal, a bass guitar, a mono piano, whatever, fantastic. It's about three and a half thousand dollars. Now, you know where I'm going to go. However, if you've got a garage and you want to record bands live and you've got three and a half thousand dollars to spend total, you can get yourself an inexpensive computer, an eight input interface. Look at look at Audient with the Evo 16 and the SPA, mm-hmm. and still have money left over to get something like maybe an 80s or early 90s soundtracks or Soundcraft console. Start thinking outside of the box. This is what we go in and we go, we go, you could buy interfaces with good mic pre's, or if you want a lot of really good, especially if you want a sum, let's just say you've got interfaces and you've got four inputs. Yeah. Start thinking about, well, there's used things that to that give you bang for the buck. Because some of those, some of those things like those Amex now, I've seen Amex Einsteins for like twenty five hundred dollars. Now that would maybe been a wow. one off, but there was one recently about five or six thousand. That was like a seventy, eighty thousand, hundred thousand dollar cons pound console twenty five years ago. So there's many. It, it, the book goes into like how can you? What's the best bang for the buck? When should you buy new? How much budget have you got? Here's things to do because obviously having a, a, a Neve style ten seventy three, especially a high quality one like a BAE, is a really smart move. But what are you really recording? What's the best bang for the buck? And people love walking into studios. And if they saw a 24-channel, you know, 80s or 90s console that might be class AB, those mic pre's sound great. And you could sum 12 mics down to four inputs on your interface. And that console might cost you 1250 bucks. 
Yes. I, I mean, I had a tax scorpion that I bought for two thousand and sold for seven fifty, which I never, which I never sold. I made records that charted on that console, like charted, charted, not nice. like ninety nine. I mean, like in the top ten on a tax scorpion. So. And nobody ever said, oh, I can tell the mic pros weren't as good as my... No, nope. nobody noticed. No, nope. but th- yeah. exactly to, to further your, your point, you could spend the $3,500 on that wonderful preamp. If you don't know what you're doing with it, yeah. you may as well be using something from the lowest of the low. And yeah, y- yeah it, good gear doesn't fix bad practice. And I've definitely yeah. learned that the hard way, but... If, yep. if, if, and, and again, this is a comprehensive book that I can see there's, there's, there's choices of, of why you should use certain microphones, the three stages of music production, pre production. I didn't know what pre production was until I'd already been producing for several years. And I was like, yep. oh, you can actually sit a band down first and talk about yep. like why the song isn't very good. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, just, I think yeah. a lot of the time, these books that I was looking at, and you'll probably resonate with you, you know, Sometimes the guys or girls, um, you know, people writing them had a couple of credits in something, and that was good. And they were probably universally educated like that. But what I found was happening a lot of the time is that there wasn't anybody writing a book like myself, and I'm going to really date myself. All of, I've done other things. I worked at a print company between record deals, and but I always played covers gigs and had my own band for those three or four years I was doing that. But with the exception of that, three or four year period where I was working at a print gig during the day from the age of 16 to my lofty age now, which I'm not going to say on camera because it's 975 years old for anybody that watches Doctor Who, they'll know the reference. Um, all I've ever done in my life is do music. And all I've done is record and I've had number one albums and I've had number one singles and I've had all of the things that people in our industry have. I'm not unique. Anybody that's been in this industry professionally has had all of those things, has gold and platinum records. I'm not unique. I'm one of those people in that situation. Um, But I've also, more importantly, had home studios. There was one stage in LA. I co-owned Swing House. I was the second biggest owner of that after Phil. So we would have Soundgarden in. We had um, Chili Peppers from 99 on. So I did pre-production on Californication, you know, which was the big comeback album. Um, obviously, um, we had we had um, Audio Slave. Obviously, we had Iggy and the Stooges in multiple times when they got back together for the first time with Mike Watt playing bass. It was in my room. I was sitting in the control room opposite. I've and I also owned Harmony Studios where we did Adele, Someone Like You, my. Uh, my daughter's godfather was the engineer on that. He won a Grammy for it. I also owned this studio, Spitfire. I had another studio in this place called Cold Stages. At one stage, I had three studios going and mixing and mastering and doing stuff from home as well. I've done it all. I've I, I've experienced it all. I've been A and R at two labels. I've managed bands. It's like, it's not something that I sort of like. I just feel like it's really important. I have dipped my hands in all of these things and I've been blessed to have success in so many of these arenas. And to me, like writing this book really meant something important to me that I could bring all of these ideas together in one. And I thought about, you know, doing a book on mixing or doing a book on mastering or doing a book on pre-production. And I'm not saying I won't write another 450 page thing on just one of those areas. But I also thought like, I, I want to, I don't, you know me, Adam, I don't do things by halves. I didn't want to do a cash-in thing. We were joking about it earlier, about YouTubers who do kind of like photocopied books of information put together and then sell it. Yeah. You know, for more than we're selling this book. You, you know, that's not me. I got to do this. And I, again, I can't do it without Jerry Hammock. Jerry Hammock, he's the brain that takes all of my ideas, all of my experiences, and pulls it all together. Without him, there's, there's no book. Well, there's a book, but it's not as good. <laughs> yeah and yeah. you say you've spent quite a long well three years was it making this book so it's it's not as three if, years yeah it's not as if it was slapped together and no. even at all i mean obviously i say that for dramatic effect but just yep. looking through the the index it goes and goes and goes and goes and everything that i'm looking at i'm looking at going maybe i should read this and just see if there's anything i've missed something i can brush up on I mean, I'm, I'm, oh, no, pro- totally. I'm, I'm I mean, like you, constant learning, constant improvement. Yeah. But yeah. wow, there's just so much that I'll bet there have been times when you think, right, the book's done. 
oh, but I, I want to add this in. I want to add that in. I want to add this in. Yep. So yeah. was it like that, or did you sit down with a master plan at the start? Well, the, ma- the master the master plan was to just be the definitive book in the arena and start off. Now, I mean, I'm sure all these, uh, a lot of these guys and girls will go back and review their books and, you know, up their game, and I, I hope so too. But one of the things was is like talking of Al Schmidt and talking of other people in this arena. I'd had some candid conversations with them about their experiences about being with publishing companies. And the publishing deals are, are, are not very big money up front, if at all, sometimes. And then the percentages are quite small. Now, obviously, you and I have a luxury of having worked really hard in, in a social media sense so that we have an audience that will buy our books. So yeah. I don't really need to go to a publishing company. Um, so, and also I think actually the main reason why I didn't want to, I wanted to self-publish this was purely and simply so we can do revisions much quicker. Um, I'd like to be able to regularly do revisions um, and, you know, make sure that this is always super cutting edge. We're going to have a website available long-term that's going to have all the examples of all this stuff available. It's going to be something that we keep growing on. Um, the other thing I think is really important to talk about, you know, is like it's my experience of being a musician, is being a producer, an engineer, a mixer, a songwriter, um, also working in film and TV, you know, having music in film and TV, but also I did two seasons of X Factor as a star producer. So I got to work on like really cutting edge, high pressure TV and producing tracks for that was really inspiring. But I think actually one of the biggest things to talk about that outside of my million year experience of this is the fact that I've interviewed every major producer, engineer and mixer in the world and picked their brains. So when you go through the book, you'll see like quotes from JJP, from Bob Clear Mountain, and you'll be like, oh, this all makes sense. Because I've been able to sit down and ask Daniel Lanois stuff that not many people can do. And a lot of it's on YouTube and a lot of it's not on YouTube because a lot of the time the camera goes off and then you ask them something and then they tell you an off-the-record story which they wouldn't ever share and you take that piece of information and it's in the book. It's in there. It's not going to necessarily be, a, you know, um, outing the guilty or anything like that, but it's information in there which is pretty darn exclusive. So mm. I feel really, really blessed. Um, it's an accumulation of all of my knowledge, Jerry's knowledge as well with his know-how of organization and all of these guys and girls that we have interviewed over the years and all of the stuff they've imparted on us. It's pretty awesome. I think it would be very difficult to compete with this if I was trying to write something from outside of it because you'd have to go and interview like four or 500 producers, engineers, and mixers to be able to write a book that could compete with this. Do do you think you're going to have a spare three months to make an audiobook version? Because <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do an audiobook. We were we really? were hoping to do it. I was it. joking, but wow. No, but you, you know, as you know, Adam, we, we we just bought a new studio, and it's a purpose built studio um, that we bought from a company called Killer Tracks, who are big film and TV composers. Really lovely guys. It's uh, a lot closer to my house. Um, it's purpose built. It's got fiber laid to it up here in the canyon. We looked at getting fiber. It was going to be $13,500 to get it laid. Yep, $13,500. And then the payment was going to be 600 and something a month, nearly 700 bucks. With, And then we looked at this studio, which is purpose-built, beautifully designed rooms, incredible rooms, uh, rooms, plural, not just one. And we're looking at it, and I said to them, you know, what's the internet here? They're like, oh, we got fiber, and it's like 100 bucks a month. I'm like... <laughs> Where do I sign? I mean, it was just like, it's saving me money moving in there. Um, you know, on, 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 on some of the most many, uh, you know, re- remedial things. I was about mm. to say me- medieval things. I, think I like that. <laughs> well, it's, it's medieval pretty medieval. Internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah. that's a good point in and of itself is that as YouTube has changed, as studios have changed, as everything has yeah. changed, our needs have changed haven't they? Yeah. It kind of yeah. what it, what it used to be was what's your ultimate studio is a million channel desk in a live room the size of France. Oh, and- it's no secret. I'm selling the SSL. I've already had three offers on it already. Wow. Um, but I think I know the person who's going to buy it, say another mm. family friend. Um, but we're, we're ha- taking backup offers and we're selling it for a reasonable price, not overpriced. And um, we are going to put, because there's two control rooms, we are going to put consoles in there, but they're going to be much smaller format, far mm. more modern, feature sets that people normally have 
and it's going to be a more of a mixing in a box using stuff hybrid. We're going to have all, we're going to cherry pick some of this beautiful gear. We're going to get some new stuff in there. Um, it's going to be pretty spectacular, pretty nice. darn spectacular. Yeah. And, and yeah, so it's, yeah, I think for, so that's, that's what it was that people were wanting. And as you say, you're selling the desk, that's, that was a surprise to me, but I think that what what we need now for what we do as educators is basically a nicely treated film studio, which yeah, is a very different thing from what you would have needed even 10 years ago. Did I send you photos? Uh, no, not yet. All right. Uh, well, I'll give you a, have a look. I'll give you, I'll give you an uh, uh, exclusive one. So here's Mark came by today. So here's Eric. Can you see this? This is Eric yeah. sitting in one of the control rooms. Oh, Nice. Look at that. There's two identical control rooms. And all of that furniture is is staying in there. Nice. So yeah. Look so at look at look at look at the the the, the soundproofing, the um can't see as, as well in that photo, but it's got all it's completely in utter it's one of the most beautiful sounding rooms I've ever been in. I took Mark in here and he's like, This sounds amazing. <laughs> and um, and gonna- importantly, you will look right on camera there. Which well, I mean, yeah. It, it, well, no, it, nobody can really control my my errant hair doing whatever it wants. That will yeah. always be a always be a source of discussion for every everybody trying to troll me on YouTube. Um, yeah, I get everything. I've got Elvis. Um, uh, you, any anything that anybody with dyed black hair and sideburns. I always always funny when people say you dye your hair. I'm like, yeah. Last time I checked, I'm in the music industry. I've been dyeing my hair since I was like. 15. When I was 16 years old, I had a pink mohawk. And that was the first time around. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> I've dyed it black. I've dyed it pink. In the 90s, I had bleached blonde, spiky hair. Um, yeah, I've always, I'm, I'm, I I'm. lost my check. Yep. When I pitch myself, yep. I'm alive and I'm in the music industry. So, you know, I, I, I haven't worn them for a while, but I used to always wear skull rings. You know, I had black dyed hair and skull rings and leather jackets. I, it's kind of what people do that are in the, um, what, what are we in again? The music industry. Indeed. I'm not a, chart, I'm not a chartered accountant. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so I just think it's funny when people say you dye hair. I'm like, uh, yeah, I dye it red maybe. <laughs> yeah, fair play to you. I, I used to I used to dye my hair black as well, and then uh, one day my hair's quite thin. Um, it started to snap and fall out, so I I had to stop doing it. But uh, if you don't have you, to, you, hey. But you have long hair as well. That'd be a little bit like somebody saying, "Why don't? Because you know, why do you have long hair?" You're like, "Because I'm in the music industry." Yes, you know, it's, very much so. Yeah, <laughs> it's a weird thing when people get strange. You know, I when they start talking about it. Um, like you, like you have. Yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, you know. <laughs> a, a very strange uh, kind of thing. I mean, Elvis was blonde. We all know that. Yes, you know? yes, indeed. So like, Elvis, why are you dyeing your hair? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the... M- 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 <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing. But uh, all, joke, all joking aside, um, you know, we're blessed to do this and the book has been... It's been a labour of love and, you know having the right people around to help. We had some really amazing illustrations done. We, we spent a lot of time getting the illustrations done. Uh, we had this wonderful Irish uh, artist working with us who did an amazing job. I could say Richard Oliver, who you probably know. He's he's Wampler. He's all those guys. You know Richard? Yes. He does. Yes, they yeah, do. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, English guy. Yeah, so he, so he he did all the pagination and, and, the, and the basic book design. Um, and, and helps with website development and everything. I mean, we we got some really good people, really good, hardworking, all in it for the same goal. Mm. And something like a book as well, as I'm sure you know, it doesn't make anybody rich. Um, no, uh, you know, it's we're keeping the price down, and I'm splitting everything fifty fifty with Jerry. We own it a hundred percent together. Good equally. stuff. Um, I- the only way is, to make money out of books now is to write a whole series, but crank one out every year. And this isn't the kind of, of material that you can do that with anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, we will, we are doing other things. We've got other things in the plans. We've also working with other writers that want to bring out books and stuff like that. Um, mm. So it's definitely the beginning of, of stuff. We should do some stuff together. Yeah. Um, because I think it's an important part because 
for me, I even thought at one stage about doing some of our courses on D- DVDs because there's still people. It's it's really. I know it sounds. Everybody's probably laughing at this point. Like oh, stream, you know, whatever. I get it. I agree. But we're trying to talk to lots of people. It's a little bit like yes. computer technology. Um, we're running, still running a cheese grater over here, which is insane. I mean, the Mac is from 2009, runs on SSL. And when we live stream, we're live streaming from a 2009 with Pro Tools. And it's always funny because people say, Pro Tools crashes like every minute. And I'm like, how many live streams have we done? We've done we do one every Friday for the last six or seven years. And then we do one on YouTube at the moment, doing one a week. So I don't know, that's 50, 350. I'd go like 500 live streams. Running screen flow, streaming live, you know, on a 2009 computer, you know, and we've never had yeah. a crash. But it crashes all the time. It's like, and I'm not having a competition about different DAWs because I think they're all the same, you know. They're all about, yes. you use Reaper and know it back to front. I know Pro Tools back to front. That's more important than which one, which, which DAW is better. Who cares? Yes. Exactly. Which one do you know really well? It's funny, I sometimes come to Pro Tools' defence and people are like, what, you're the Reaper guy? No, I'm I'm a guy that mixes. Uh, and yeah. it's not what I use, but yeah, I don't find that Pro Tools really crashes either. Um, it just I don't know isn't... anybody that uses it professionally. I've asked a couple of people who said that and they're like, I heard. They're like, I heard it does this. I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have stumbled upon the unfortunate CPU overload error a lot, but that depends on what you're doing. That depends on if you're trying to drown the poor machine. <laughs> you know, right? That's right. Um, if if you brought that upon yourself, that's a whole different thing. But <laughs> yeah, and then the other thing is, and this is what, where my conversation was going towards, not actually towards so much the DAW thing, because I think all DAWs have their strengths and weaknesses, and it doesn't really matter if you know your DAW inside out. You know, I, there's there's albums that are made on GarageBand. If you know it inside out, it can make it sound great. That's all that matters. And yes. just the same way, you know, uh, Death Cab for Cutie, or was it the Postal Service, which one of those two bands? Um, oh, no, it wasn't either of those two bands. I'm blanking what it's called. Um, begin with S. Sorry, everybody. Answers on the postcard. Remember they made their album on a Roland VS880? Remember the little grey box? The oh, eight-track ooh. digital thing? Yeah. Ooh, blanking wow. on the name of the band. It's terrible. I can't remember. It was a massive album. It was like a million, million album selling thing back in a time when people would buy albums. It, it, the, the the gear is irrelevant. It's yes. uh, it's knowing the gear well enough to get great results. Because like you said earlier, you can give somebody a rack of BAE 1073s, you know, four U47s, a couple of U67s, and the best room in the world to record in, and it doesn't mean the music's going to be good. It just yeah. means they've got good gear to record in. It doesn't even know they doesn't even mean they know how to use it properly, you know, or yep. or well. Um, yeah, there's so much more to music than that, and which is another reason why, you know, going back to the very beginning of the, talking about the channel, that's the reason why I spend a lot of time talking about the actual music as well as how it's recorded. Because to me, I need to I need people to feel inspired like I am to make music. I want somebody to watch a, a video we did like we did like a couple of days ago on Sam Cooke and be inspired to make music like Sam Cooke, which is orchestrated. And more importantly, and something that never gets talked about on YouTube, Music is not just about the gear. It's not just about the chord sequence. It's about the message. It's about yes. the message. You're, I don't know what year you were born in. You're too young. Even if you were, even if you were born at this time, you'd been like one. But when two-tone came along, it changed the world. It changed Britain forever. Because in 1978, the Conservative Party had just come in, and you'd look at the Houses of Parliament and the House of Lords, there was nothing but old white people there. That was it. It was just, and then two tone comes out. The country's in total disarray, and you're like, "Wait there, Are these this is a complete mixed race band." And it wasn't really a big deal to real people because real people are like, "Yeah, this is what we look like. This is a representation of our country." Just because you turn on the BBC News in those days, and it was like, "Good evening, here is the news," and the House of Parliament all looked like you know 65 and older white guys. The reality was is that is not Britain. That was not Britain. So there is music doing something more than a Neve 1073 and a chord sequence and a clever melody. There's more to music. Sometimes the best songs in the world are two chords. You know, working class hero A minor and G right to the end. I think he plays an E at the end. But the point is, like, a two chord song says more. The lyrics mean something. It speaks to people. You, you know, we have a tendency on YouTube 
to sort of glorify complexity or smartness and all this kind of stuff and forget that most people in this world don't care about their stuff. They, there's other things that resonate with them. Um, so anyway, that to me, if I can showcase all of these things, maybe some complicated chord sequences, maybe some amazing recording techniques, maybe talk about, you know, albums like Supertramp or ELO, which are masterpieces of production, mixed in with, you know, stuff like we did the Velvet Underground, we've done E and the Stooges, you know, all of this, if you bring it all together with, of course, the music that we built our industry on, which of course is the blues and jazz, you know, we're talking about Robert Johnson and Wes Montgomery and Charlie Christian, and of course, Miles Davis, we've done, we've done videos on all of that. To me, that is what why we do this is to connect it all together, make it all make sense. Because I don't know about you, but I didn't get in the music industry because I wanted to know what a U47 was. I just put on a record and I went, what is that? And for me, it was Queen. And it was just like, I remember looking at that album, pulling out the, the sleeve and seeing all the faces and seeing these guys with long hair and nobody I knew in my little village had long hair. And I was just like, what is this? This is wrong. Ooh, this is dangerous. You know, I, and I remember it said no synthesizers on the record. I didn't even know what a synthesizer was. I just knew that obviously a synthesizer was a bad thing. <laughs> and all of those crazy noises were coming from the guitar player. And I was like, oh, my God, you mean this Brian May guy can make all of these sounds, you know, uh, on a guitar? I was like, Whoosh. Oh, it was That's a very similar me. experience for me, actually. Um, for me, um, my life was set on this path. Uh, I must have been maybe six years old and my dad put headphones on me and it was How Soon Is Now by The Smiths with that And And I didn't know what production was at six years old. But yeah, I was just like, this, this is me now. <laughs> and so, yeah. I, mean, I, I like I, you more now, Adam. <laughs> you said How Soon Is Now. You didn't, you weren't was, trying to be, oh. I was a fantastic song. But stuff like oh. that, I, I knew what yeah. a good production was when I was six years old. I didn't have yeah. words to describe that but See, my I, story i was seven so you got me beat by a year oh, i was whoa. seven when i got when i got a night at the opera you were you were six I, you heard I, I might have been seven i can't remember exactly but it was that kind of age no, you know, you'd be younger than me i like young, it young like and that. impressionable definitely yeah and, it's beautiful even like i i remember i was really in love as a kid with stuff like um michael jackson's albums and mm. uh, apart from it being great songs which they were they sounded fantastic and I didn't know why. And I've spent my entire life chasing that kind of, I want this good music to be presented in its best light so that everybody just gets it. So when did you hear 2112? Oh, I was, I was about six or seven. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, right. I, I distinctly remember that because as a young impressionable boy, the story of 2112 was so overwhelming. I remember being in tears. Uh, because wow. yeah because there's this whole bit where the guy gets his guitar destroyed and and kind of civilization is crumbling uh, and i'm reading the lyrics and being really affected and that's why i want to be getty lee <laughs> well and neil neil pert for for writing those incredible yes, lyrics very much yeah. so um we had yeah. my first band was called exp named after the Jimi hendrix song um and uh we, my drummer was Stephen Collins. Stephen, if you're watching, hello. Um, and Stephen had a, a Pearl Maxwin kit, which was the cheaper, cheap Pearl. It was like the cheapest entry level kit. And it was, I think it was Orange Sparkle. Yeah, it was Orange Sparkle. And I had my homemade guitar that my dad made for me. And I had this amp called uh, FAL, F A L, Futuristic AIDS Limited, I think, or Amplification Limited. I know FAL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a dreadful amp. It was a bass amp. It had volume trouble bass, no distortion. <laughs> and I bought a Carlsbra. Carlsborough Suz pedal, and it was the worst distortion ever. Now, of course, it's worth a fortune because it's rare and vintage and weird, you know. But I wanted a DS1. You know, I wanted a, I wanted the Gary Moore DS1 Boss distortion pedal, um, but I couldn't afford it because it was like three times the price. It was like £30, and the pedal I had was like £13. Um, so anyway, um, that was my guitar setup. So dreadful guitar sound through a bass amp and uh, my homemade guitar. And we discovered his two favourite bands were the Ramones and Rush. And, and Ramones for the attitude and Rush because, of course, Neil, Pe Neil Peart. I was going to say, they couldn't be more different. <laughs> yeah. But when you're a drummer, you know, it kind of, doo -doo 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 -doo, kind of Ramones or, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, it was like, it's yeah, all about yeah, the yeah. energy and the attitude. 
And, of course, he wrote all the lyrics because we're like, that's what drummers do. Neil Peart <laughs> writes the lyrics for Rush, so you have to write the lyrics. So he'd write all these, like, flowery kind of, like, mountains and dragons and all this kind of stuff to, to be like Rush. And I, I wrote my um, – I remember learning trees when I was – because that was the B-side of Spirit of the Radio in England. Uh, which was, you know, a massive, massive hit. So I bought the single, Spirit of the Radio, and I put the B-side on, and I was like, oh, what is this song? So I sat there with my grandfather's hand-me-down record player and played everything at a slower speed in the wrong key and everything because 45 to 16 does not equate. 33 mm. to 16 works pretty well because it's like it goes down an octave, but 45 to 16, not so good. But, you know, I just sat there and tried to figure out how to play trees, and eventually I did. Um, now I want to go and... Do, 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 do. There is unrest in the forest. There is trouble with the trees. For the maples want more sunlight and the oaks ignore their pleas. Ah! Oh. I'll bet that's been tattooed on your brain at this point, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, such a good song and uh, and a great kind of gateway drug back into like discovering, you know, going back to Fly By Night and all this kind of stuff. And I went all the way back and, you know, because I, I bought the albums when they came out. So I had Permanent Waves when it came out. And that was like the first Rush album I bought when it was brand new. Shows you how old I was. I mean, you know, I was one, yeah, if only. <laughs> but, you know, so I bought Permanent Waves and then I went back and filled in all the gaps all the way up to it. Um, yeah. Very yeah, nice. great, great band. I, I've great, got great an original band. vinyl of Permanent, Permanent Waves somewhere. It's the one where the newspaper headline wasn't, wasn't whited out. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was yeah. a whole kind of, uh, all- yeah, Dewey defeats Truman thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, well, that that's my dad's copy, which I've got. That I was very much brought up in a Rush household. But I, I think Good. my my dad Did maybe dad play a few music? years. Yeah, he's a bass player. Um, I think he's a few years older than yourself, but he didn't do it pro- yeah. professionally. Um, right. But but there was enough, and my granddad was a bass player as well, so I definitely had influence. Wow. Um, yeah, my granddad gave me. I think my I think it was him gave me my first bass. It was a a terrible copy of a Rickenbacker. <laughs> it, was, right. uh, it was a real dog to play, but I kind of learned by fighting it and then got a better instrument and was like, actually, this isn't as hard as it was made out to be. Because yep. I'd been yep. fighting action that was like telegraph poles and kind of getting grip strength. <laughs> we had, I had the same thing. I, I, I didn't know that kind of stuff. And, and, you, you, and the strings we bought were, I think we had like 11 to... 54s was my first set on an electric guitar with an action like this. Ooh. It's just, you know, you don't know, do you? No. Um, because you ask you ask questions and you get answers based on the question you ask. So my dad would probably have gone into the music store because we were poor and probably said, like, you know, I, I need to buy strings for the guitar we're building, you know, um, what would last the longest or something like that because that would be where my dad would think. And, of course, the guitar store guy would have said, oh, get some thick ones. They won't break as easily. So, you know, <laughs> that's what we did. Our first guitar had like tree tr- tree trunks and he didn't know about the action. And we eventually obviously figured that out as I got better at playing. Like, oh, if I just drop, oh, yeah, that's better. You know, we figured all that out with time. But yeah, it's I, just one yeah. of those things you... I, I remember shimming the neck of my guitar with cornflake packets. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Funnily enough, this... This very guitar, which you can't see on the audio podcast, I do apologise, but this thing, which I think I showed you, showed you earlier, this was yeah. my first guitar when I was 11, and it's still the best guitar that I've I've had. Um, wow. The frets have been stoned. Uh, it's got new so, tuners, new everything. <laughs> so was it... Oh, no, it's amazing. Was it owned by Fender? Yes, the, I believe. Because it's got a Mustang on it. Yes, so Sun. Sun was there. I'm I looking it up. I believe that was Fender India. I'm Googleizing. I know for a fact that... At some point, Fender did uh, buy the rest of Sun if they didn't own it outright already. Um, because you get amps like the Sun Model T, which all the doom rock and metal bands adore, which is right. the like 200-watt face-melting monster of a thing. Uh, but yeah, they also made those strats called the, the Mustang. I've got, I've got a pair of them. I've got one that's still kind of stock and sounds awful. And uh, sounds like I remember. And one that is Vintage Fender Sung Mustang H H S S. So humbucker single single Stratocaster. Oh, it says India. Yes. Where's yours made? India. Yes. Sun made in India. Wow. The old joke was that it was somebody's uh, fence panels cobbled together. 
Wow. But um, if you saw it on camera, it was a wood finish. Um, it wasn't originally. It was candy apple red. And uh, it was horrible, so we stripped it back. I say we, me and my dad, he helped me. And uh, I must have only been 13 or 14 at the time, but it made it mine. No, I love that. Yeah. Um, I'm looking up. Yeah, Sun Mustang. Worth all of three and a half dollars. <laughs> Oh, Sun I, Mustang Stratocaster, nineteen ninety. What year do you think yours is? I think mine's eighty nine. Oh, this doesn't think, have a proper headstock. How does what does your headstock look like? Has it got a proper uh, fender headstock? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Um. Yeah, it's a proper strap. Headstock. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, this one I'm looking at doesn't have that. Yeah, this is one of the earlier models. It doesn't have the skunk stripe down the back of the neck. It's uh, a one piece. Uh, Sun the Fender length- Mustang base. Oh, oh! I well, should they want, get one they of want those. Some, they want some. They want some serious money for that. I'm not surprised. Like seven hundred, seven hundred bucks. Mm. I'm swimming in bases anyway, so that's quite all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm the other way around. I've probably got five bases and fifty guitars. I've wow. got a PVT forty, which I absolutely love. I've got uh, the cheap Hofner. Um, I've got two, two. Um, uh, Yamaha bases, BB series. Mm, the, I've got the, solid. the yeah, I've got the um, Peter Hook one. Um, oh, and I've got the Peter Hook six string as well. Um, and I've got the, um, so I've got one, two, three, four, five. And then I've got a um, a Mexican um, Squire um, jazz bass, which I upgraded. So I've got, what's that, seven? Is that seven? One, two, three four, five, no, six. I've got six bases, which I suppose is quite a lot to have, but it doesn't feel anything close to the amount of guitars I own. So, Yes. I, I'm kind of a half, I'm about half and half because I focus on bass. I think I've got some, I've got four bases in this room. Uh, this is, this is my home office, <laughs> but I think I've got, oh, God knows how many at the studio because they're all different. They're like, they're like cars, aren't they? It's like the, this one does this thing. This one does that thing. Yeah. I think the PVT 40, um, uh, I've alerted people to this. It's probably one of the best bases ever made um, that that nobody cares about um, because it's one of the most, and I mean this in a really good way, one of the most generic bass tones. It just kind of goes boo. So if you want to like a bass to just glue things together yeah. without too much personality, it's like the opposite of Rickenbacker. You know, when you yes. play, when Geddy Lee plays the Rickenbacker, it's like, hello, everybody, I'm a bass. Yeah. I'm a Rickenbacker. You know, it's like, bite clung, clung, yeah. clung, 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 I could be wrong, and I, I could Googleize this too, but I think it's I think it's like an oak body or something. It's got the heaviest body ever in the known, and then the hardware on it is ridiculous. Let me oh, let me grab it, with grab two, it on camera. Two humbuckers. Yeah. Wow. It's, wow. Look at this. I'll grab it now for those people. Oh my god, it's so heavy. Look at the size of that bridge. Wow. <laughs> for the time, that is that is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, it, it was made. It was designed in the seventies. <laughs> Mm. I mean, that reminds me very much of the, the Gibson Grabber and the Ripper, if you remember those. Probably from the same time oh, period. I, yeah, I own I owned one of those. Did you have the one with the sliding pickup? Yep. Wow. I that had... Um, the, that would have been the Grabber then, I guess? Yeah, I had the I had the RD Artist as well. Nice. They go for that a pretty wasn't mine. penny that these w- days. That was borrowed from, um, I borrowed borrowed it from uh, Jute, my friend Julian Butcher, Matt Butcher's brother. Matt's uh, like the biggest sound man, I think, in England. He does the gorillas and all that stuff. He's one of my, they're some childhood friends of mine. And um, Jute bought it, and it's actually, it's a black RD artist with a with a silver you know, chrome scratch plate. And oh, it was, wow. um, it, it, yeah, it belonged to Phil Liner. Oh, wow. And I'm That's... a huge Thin Lizzy fan. Yeah, well, yeah. Combine that with the fact that Chris Novoselic from Nirvana was was famous for using those, and you can't find them for love nor money these days. No, they're they're really good sounding basses. Mm. I think Again, you, you've got to heavy. be about six foot five and have uh, seventeen foot long arms just to reach round the thing, though. Yeah, I'm six one, so I'm a little little inadequate when it comes to the 
the height necessary to play an RD artist. But <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. At five ten with short arms, I'm hilariously unequipped for that, which is why I mainly play jazz bassists because they're super comfortable. I I thought you were taller than that. Do you, do, you, uh, do you like to wear a couple of inch heels on your on the shoes? Oh, I wish. Um, I'm, <laughs> it's funny. I'm I'm quite tall in the body, but when I stand up, I'm completely you know national average. So yeah, I, I, I look tall on camera, but I I just don't have like boxers limbs. It's funny when I met when I met Mark Mark Daniel Nelson because I actually knew him on camera, even though we were doing videos together before I actually physically met him. Mm. I, I always thought he was going to be about five nine. And he's actually like six one as well, maybe even right. six one and a half. I'm like, wait there, you know. <laughs> and then, then for people, people always because I'm not six one's a pretty average height, you know. It's not massively tall, but I meet people and they're always like, oh, you're much taller than I thought. So it must be on camera. I must look like I'm a short person or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's all about the angles. All about the angles. What do, What do you think? Talking of height, Eric. Um, I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> As Eric, Eric always... is famously six foot five. And... Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Funnily enough, I'm looking at a picture of Eric right now because that's on the page I landed on in the book where he's measuring speakers. He is. He's quite heavily featured in the book, and so is Lily as well. It's mainly Eric, and then there's some Lily. There's a few of me, <laughs> but but Eric. Uh, because we had loads of things where we wanted uh, photos of assistants doing stuff or engineers doing stuff, so we we're like, well, Eric's. Both of those things. He's assisted and he's an engineer. So, engineer setting up microphone. And there's Eric. That, that's that's great to see because I, like going back to my experience of the uh, older books, shall we say, from nearly twenty years ago now, which is yeah, betraying my age a little bit. Um, there weren't really any pictures of of that kind of thing of seeing someone actually doing the thing for you to just double check and go, "Am I doing this right?" Because that that was yeah. that was a, that was a thing at the time. Is even though the book said like do a thing with a thing, if you misinterpreted it, you could get some you know, terrible mistakes. I, I distinctly remember one time that I was told by a book to throw a microphone in the back of the guitar cabinet and didn't exactly say where or why. And I remember it sounding like absolute garbage. Yeah. But thinking, oh, the book told me to do it. It must sound great. And in the studio thinking, oh, sounds fine. And then taking it home and going, oh, my word, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. Um, I, I mean, it goes back to what, what you know, what you, you mentioned earlier. It For us, it was a case of like, let's make sure we cover everything that everybody else did and more. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we can write additional books on going into massive detail in any particular areas, but we wanted this to be, there's a reason why it's called Home Studio Recording, The Complete Guide. It, I didn't, I, I don't, you know, like I said earlier, I don't like doing things by halves. And if I'm going to do a book on it, we've really got to go into massive detail and get it from one place. Here it is. I, I mean, there's so much acquired knowledge from my experience and then all of the people we've interviewed and then Jerry's experience and everything in between that to me, it seemed like I'd be falling short if I didn't spend three years researching and writing a book properly. Um, yeah. And there will be an audio book, as you've mentioned, where once we move into the place at the beginning of May, I'm going to start um, because it's like the studio is like air conditionally silent. You walk in the room, close the door, it's like shh. So it's going to be perfect Set up a microphone in there. All the computers are going to be in different rooms. It's going to be, oh. Ah, Absolute that's what you dream want. come true. Yeah. Good stuff. And yeah. so, yeah. Very, very exciting. You'll be able to have your morning coffee and just do an hour's audio book every day. And then within 500 yeah. years, it'll be ready. Because, well, I, I mean, think I exaggerate I, I, for comedic effect, but honestly, I'm skipping through the, the, the book right now. And there is, it's wall to wall. It's not just pretty pictures. There is so much content. It's Thank you. dizzying. Honestly, it's impressive. Very impressive. Thank you. Well, three three years and Jerry. Those 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 are my secret weapons. <laughs> yeah, three years and me would be good, but three years and Jerry is what took it over the edge. Um, yeah, I'm I'm truly blessed. And and you know, oh, I haven't said this in any of these interviews, but also Michael Stucker, a very very good friend of mine, um, who commissioned this SSL here, who commissioned my um, 8058 when I had my Neve 8058. Um, 
and help, has helped maintain stuff. He's a professor at Indiana University. He's also a world-class engineer who engineered for John Mellencamp, and he also ran studios, repairs studios, keeps things. The guy is a freaking genius. He's also the guy that I've designed audio equipment with um, and guitar pedals and everything in between. Um, he read through the book and gave me tips as well, and without him... It wouldn't be possible. It's, there's a lot of brains and a lot of a lot of smart people that uh, really helped. Even if it was just encouragement and you know pointing to the good things and go do more of that. You know, um, it's been really blessed. I, I don't know if anything like this could ever be done without it um, being a team effort. Um, yeah, you know, I've had friends that have worked on things that never got accredited, and and people have taken all the responsibility as though they did everything. We were talking about it this morning, Mark and I, about a particular movie that came out. And the actor was like, you know, all the music was written, produced and engineered and mixed by me. And we we both know like tons of people that worked on it and played the instruments and recorded it. And making things ego-based is just silly to me. I think we, the why, again, it's called Produce Like a Pro and not Warren's Place is because it is all about guys like you that bring knowledge and enthusiasm, and that's we have to recognize everybody's contribution because without it, it's just another ego maniacal kind of you know, look at me, I'm so special. I don't believe that at all. Um, there's a line that Sam, um, you know, Sam obviously, Sam highlighted, and I thought was really beautiful. Let me see if I can find it. If there's one thing you take away from this, there's no difference between us, we make music because we love to. There are no experts. Spoken by a true expert. <laughs> oh, God, I'm kidding, no. I'm kidding. No, no. But, but it's, yeah. No, it you is, know what it's I mean? so true, yes. So um, by the time this goes out, uh, you said the book will be available. Uh, where, yeah, it's, it's, do we know where it will be found? We're going to, uh, we'll give you the URL. Um, it's on Amazon, you know, the, the world's number one book uh, seller and reseller. Um, so there'll be a link for you to buy it uh, from Amazon. We are going to be signing 300, or I'm going to be signing initially, 300 copies of the hardback, which will be sold separately. You can go to the website and buy it there. You can put an order in there and ask who to write it to, and I'll individually hand sign it to, you know, John. Keep If you want to buy it as a present for a loved one or even just for yourself, I will hand sign it Um it's more expensive because I have to buy it, ship it to me, <laughs> yeah, sign it, and then ship it back out. Um, so unfortunately, it'll be a little bit extra. But we're only going to—we're actually going to charge an average price for shipping all over the world. So it means if you live in New Zealand or whatever, you'll be paying the same price as somebody in America or somebody wherever because we we, we don't want people to be penalised in any area. So we're going to find an average shipping price for anywhere in the world. Um, and that price for the hardback cover with me signing it and dedicated to you will be uh, uh, one universal price. So you can go to homestudiorecording.com and look at, you could look at the breakdown of the book on there. You can buy it. It will take you directly to a link for the soft cover or hard cover at Amazon, but you can also buy a hard cover, cover version at a premium price that I will sign and ship directly to you. Amazing. I'm looking forward to getting my own copy of this to really pour through because like I said, even, even I've been doing this 20 years and there will be things that I'll read through and I'll go, oh yeah. So I'm sure there's something for everybody. But yes, You're a rock star. Thank you very much. And so are you, Warren. Thank you very much. And we'll see you very soon. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir. Adios, two scenes, ciao, goodbye. So there you go. One fascinating interview with our friend Warren. You can get the book, Home Studio Recording, The Complete Guide from Amazon right now. The link is going to be down in the description. And so thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you on the next Behind Music Tech podcast. See you later.